King David served his generation by the will of God and fell asleep. Hello, welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley and this is the last video in this series on the Cunningham Lectures, these old works of Scottish theology. The book in question is the last volume from the 1950s, 1957 Cunningham Lectures, The Church and Scottish Social Development, 1780 to 1870 by Stuart Mechie. Now, who was Stuart Mechie? We begin with that question. Some of these uh, lectures I've been able to find very little about, but this is a man who was a historian. He's uh, roughly contemporary, actually, with the previous Cunningham lecturer, George MacLeod. Like George MacLeod, he was born in the 1890s, in 1897. And he died in 1981. So he's born in that period, right at the end of the Victorian era, and died in the modern era. The era, well, died a bit over a year after I was born. He was a lecturer in ecclesiastical history at the University of Glasgow, which meant that his base was Trinity College, Glasgow. In fact, he wrote the history. This is the slim volume, 1856 memorial volume, centenary volume, and Stuart Mechie was the author. So, the title page, there we are, there's the title page and there's the great campanile of the college. Stuart Mechie was educated at Perth Academy and then went on to study at Glasgow University. He was a student at Glasgow at the time that the the war broke out. He was a, a United Free Church man, by the way. And as a student from a middle-class background, he became a private in the army, in the Black Watch, and served with the Black Watch through the First World War. After the war, he, again, like MacLeod, went into the ministry. He trained at the United Free Church College in Glasgow, where, of course, he would later become a tutor. And in 1926 he was ordained to Crown Church in Venice, and he was there at the time of the union between the majority of the United Free Church of Scotland and the Church of Scotland. In 1936 he moved to St Anne's, Corstofine, and he remained there until 1952 when he was called to become lecturer in ecclesiastical history in Glasgow. While he was at Glasgow, he also served as Clerk of Senate and later as Librarian. He had retired in 1963. As I say, he died on March the 3rd, 1981. His subject's an interesting one because it's to do with that period of industrialisation in Scotland through to the latter part of the 19th century. It covers a period of remarkable social change when Scotland goes from being a majority agricultural society to being an industrialised nation with, of course, the great factories in Edinburgh and particularly in Glasgow. Glasgow is that great industrial powerhouse. And one of the things that came with this social change were social challenges for the church. So his chapters are, first of all, the agrarian and industrial revolutions, the change in how farm work is done, and also the change in how manufacturing was done. Secondly, progress and poverty. So one of the things that happened with industrialisation was that poverty changed. The country as a whole became richer. However the distribution of wealth remained unequal as it had been before. It's a mistake to, to think in terms of cheerful, rural, prosperous communities before the Industrial Revolution. No, there was grinding rural poverty. You look at old photographs, and you think, photographs, that means they're not that old. But you look at old photographs of villages, and if you look at old descriptions of the Highlands, 
The people are living in houses with mud floors, earthen floors. Children didn't have shoes in their childhood unless it was absolutely necessary. You're looking at a poverty that is relieved only by the fact that you can spend most of your life outdoors in the summer, but in the winter you're in the house living under the same roof as all your animals. And that was for those who weren't that poor. If you were really, really poor, starvation was a real possibility. And so the cities, the, the new factories, offered the possibility of more money. We look back, for example, we ask, well, why did people go down the mines? Look at coal mining, how dangerous and difficult it was. Coal mining without machinery. Why did anyone go down the mines in the first place? Well, because you made more money down the mine than you would in the field. The factories offered, if possible, something more than starving to death in a ditch under a hedge somewhere. The thing was that if you went into the city and you were poor and you suffered injury or illness, there was really very little to look after you. The, the villages had some kind of social family support mechanisms. In the cities, people vanished, disappeared and were fished later out of rivers and sewers, st very dead and buried unknown. This faced the church. How do we deal with these transformed circumstances? Because the Scottish church was, at the period that this book covers, initially the main, <coughs> the main organisation that provided any kind of social service in terms of poor relief, for example. In terms of education. And one of the things this book demonstrates is how certain men in the church, and particularly men in the church, particularly ministers, rose to these challenges. They were pioneers in country and in city. There were those, for example, who started saving banks. Duncan of uh, Ruthwell, he founded a savings bank, the, the first penny savings bank. The banks at the time, the you know, what we think of in terms of banks, the, the forefathers of our modern main banks, they were for the middle classes. They didn't offer savings accounts for working men. Working men received their pay and they spent it. They didn't save because they were banking fees and things that they couldn't afford. And Duncan says, no, let's start a bank for ordinary people where you can deposit pennies, not pounds, not shillings, but pennies in the bank. And then encouraging people to save money and protecting money, because, of course, if you can't put your money in a bank, it's in a sock under the bed, your door is easily broken and you're easily robbed. But in a bank, ah, the bank has a safe. The bank has security. And so it's providing banking services for ordinary people. And he did that as a minister, recognising that he could do this and nobody else seemed to be interested. Thomas Chalmers is the great name here. Thomas Chalmers, who believed firmly he could make the Paris system work in industrial Scotland. He'd been a parish minister in rural Scotland. He tried to make it work and he almost managed it in the industrial city. The Scottish church and the poor. What do you do with the poor? Well, the Scottish church very often was quite... The churches tended to be quite paternalistic towards the poor. On the one hand, you had the attitude which is sadly found in far too many places today, well, they're poor because they're thriftless. And there were others who said, no, they're poor because they're being, because their parents were poor. They're poor because they lack the ability, the provision to better themselves. 
But one thing that the Scottish ministry didn't do in those days was say, oh, they're poor because they deserve it, so just leave them to rot in their poverty. That is not a Christian attitude. The poor you always have with you so that you may do them good. Not so that you may neglect them and ignore them. Rant over. John Dunlop on the Scottish Temperance Reformation. Temperance. Now, the temperance movement managed to completely disgrace itself over prohibition in the United States. Because what prohibition in the United States meant, of course, wasn't that the United States became a nation full of teetotalers who were virtuous, but what it meant was that bootleggers and gangsters rose up to provide the booze that was now illegal. But the early Scottish temperance movement was about that. It was about temperance, self-control. It wasn't about, and sadly there came to be a conflict between, on the one hand, the absolute total abstainers, and on the other hand, the people who said, no, what we must be pushing for people is self-control. We're anti-drunkenness. Um, talking in the previous video about George MacLeod. George MacLeod's grandfather, Norman MacLeod, was part of the... Um, a responsible use of alcohol group. And the problem was that these two groups, who basically had a, a, an agreed aim, that they both, they both agreed that there's too much drunkenness in Scotland, something must be done about it. There's you know, poor people spending all their money on booze and then dying, and poor men spending their money on alcohol and beating their wives and their children that alcohol abuse was a major problem and had to be dealt with. Now, the, there's then the question, how do you deal with it? Do you deal with it by telling people, you must be a complete abstainer? Or do you say, look, alcohol is not there to be abused? And this disagreement, sadly, ended with, well, it led to, rather, the total abstainers uh, really, really being abusive towards the responsible use folk. And it's a good study, actually, in terms of, OK, how do we think about a matter that, where there is that kind of legitimate disagreement between Christians in how we deal with this social problem? Patrick Brewster and Scottish Chartism. Patrick Brewster is an interesting case. He's a man who is a Church of Scotland minister. And Chartism was this great political reform movement that said, we need to reform politics. There were some Chartists who were atheists, rationalists. Some were Unitarians. Others, like Brewster, were orthodox. Brewster felt the problem with the Church of Scotland's attitude towards the poor was it was paternalist. And actually what we want is we want a political reformation. We want to change society, to change our political structures so our political structures better serve the changed society that we live in. It's a very interesting chapter, that one, in terms of, again, Christians in politics. James Begg and the Housing of the Working Classes, Chapter 8. James Begg's a wonderful man. Absolute down-the-line conservative theologically. But he's also a man who says, look, we've got this great problem in our cities, that most of our housing stock for poor people is absolutely appalling. It's vile. It's rat-infested slums with four families in a single room. There's no privacy, there's no decency, there's, they're living in conditions of the most appalling filth. How can we expect the Scottish working man to live as a human being if he can't have a house, a cottage of his own? And so he's involved in this social housing scheme. Chapter 9, The Scottish Churches and Education. Education in Scotland, in the period covered, was very much something the churches did. And it didn't matter whether they were the establishment or the free church or the United Presbyterians, or the groups who became the United Presbyterians. Education was something the church did, and the church was deeply involved in. And so this book deals with this. It, because of the nature of this it's social history, it's very difficult to 
look at a, a striking quote and say, this is why you should read the book. But in terms of why we should read the book, well, why should anyone read a book about the Church on Scottish Social Development, 1780 to 1870? I mean, is that all in the past? Well, it shows us a proper Christian response, first of all, to political and social problems. That's not to ignore them. It's not, on the other hand, to join ourselves with the most radical political faction we can find, but it is to try to seek the good of the common man. It's a reminder, again, of those words of Christ, the poor you always have with you, so that you may do them good. And there's a challenge to us also here. Are we interested in doing the poor good? And what does it mean to do them good? It doesn't just mean giving people money, giving people handouts. There is that, that uh, saying, you, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, you teach a man to fish, you feed him for life. And one of the great things that the Scottish Church in that period emphasised was development, education, betterment. James Begg says you, you need to help people to get decent houses. Duncan of Ruthwell says you need to give men an opportunity so that they can save money. And they can do so securely. Thomas Chalmers. We must make sure that those who are poor and needy are provided for. Because they are poor and needy. The ragged school movement that says we must provide schools for these poor children who are running around the streets barefoot in rags. Because otherwise, whatever potential they have in terms of intellect will never be developed. The poor you have with you so that you may do them good. That's a challenge that the Scottish Church gives us. It's a challenge that this final volume of the Cunningham Lecture in the 1950s leaves us with. A challenge of the Church, not simply decrying false and vicious ideas about social justice but promoting true and real justice within society and promoting the great reality that everybody, everybody matters in some sense. So there we are. Cunningham lectures all the way from <coughs> justification through to retrospect. The men who spoke at the beginning of the Cunningham Lectures knew the men who are history in this last of Cunningham Lectures that we're looking at in this series. It remains today, of course, but that's my overview. Well, may, may God help us in our reading of the best books. May God bless you and keep you, and make his face to shine upon you, and give you peace. Amen.